You know how sometimes people refuse to acknowledge the source of their problems? It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. Well, the same is true when it comes to problems that are caused by the state. Hello everyone, this is My Two Cents. I've received a patron request to make a video talking about how the state often sets out to fix the very problems that it itself caused. Think of every political campaign you've ever listened to. Politicians are always telling you about how they're going to fix the problems of today. However, a little research bears out that were it not for the existence of the state itself, these wouldn't be problems to begin with. There's a lot we could talk about, so I think I'm going to need a little bit of help with this one. Legends tell of a certain wise lizard creature who dwells in another dimension. Now, I just need to figure out how to find him. Oh hi, Two Cents. I was just doing autistic things and I thought, hey, you know what sucks? When the government tries to solve problems that it itself created. Well, I guess you were easy enough to find. Let's jump right into it. Awesome. Oh hi, I'm the heretic. Hit it! Who out there has played Monopoly? I wish I could tell you that the Monopoly guy fought the good fight, and the sisters let him be. I wish I could tell you that. One thing that many of us learned in school is that free market capitalism encourages the creation of monopolies. When a monopoly gains control of an entire market, they have no competition, and can start charging outrageous amounts of money for their goods and services, leaving the poor consumers no choice but to fork over more money than to their own detriment. The state, therefore, is necessary to step in with antitrust laws, forcibly breaking up monopolies and ensuring fair competition in the market. However, have you ever stopped to consider how a monopoly forms? By definition, a monopoly must have exclusive control over the supply of a certain good or service. This could happen in at least two ways. Under true free market conditions, by which I mean all transactions are voluntary, a business could only become a monopoly if they obtained the sum total of all resources required to make their product through voluntary transaction. For example, Burger King could have a true monopoly on hamburgers if they legitimately purchased every cow in the world. It's not hard to see that this is unrealistic. While it may be possible in principle, voluntary transactions are usually not sufficient to obtain complete control of an entire resource. The other way is through force. If Burger King employees suddenly picked up torches and started burning down every other dining establishment that sold hamburgers and got away with it, they would become the only business providing hamburgers, and therefore a monopoly. This may sound silly, but the second method is actually how monopolies form. In a free market, competition is free to enter the market at any time. Suppose there is only one business in town selling hamburgers, and they out of the blue decide to triple the price. Nothing prevents someone else from opening a new dining establishment and selling hamburgers cheaper, resulting in competition that forces the previous business to bring their prices down or face losing business. But under the corporatist system we have today, when the first business sees the second trying to form, they'll likely knock on the state's door and lobby for new regulations under the guise that such regulations are necessary to help keep customers safe. The state then knocks on the door of the second business owner and informs him that he's being charged a licensing fee simply for opening a business. In addition, he'll be responsible for paying reg regulatory agencies to inspect his facilities, and required to pay a $15 minimum wage to his employees, as well as full health care benefits. Such costs are far too steep for a small business just starting out, while a well-established business will likely be able to handle these fees. When the dust settles, there's only one dining establishment left standing, and no one else wants to start a competing business due to the regulatory costs. Hence, this monopoly was formed not by free market competition, but directly by the use of the state's power to impose regulations on otherwise free and voluntary transactions. Anybody remember the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare? It was signed by President Obama in 2010. It was passed on the premise that the cost of health care was increasing, bankrupting families and hurting people, that health insurance companies refused to pay for people with pre-existing conditions. Thus, 
the government needed to step in and correct these predatory practices that make healthcare expensive. I mean, nobody's going to deny that healthcare is expensive, so something that makes insurance companies more customer-centric sounds good, right? Well, it sucks. Insurance premiums are skyrocketing, up to 300%. Even the government-subsidized health insurance plans are becoming more expensive, 22% annually for the benchmark silver plan. There's also 18 new taxes totaling over $592 billion in 2012. And according to the Congressional Budget Office, the Obamacare deficit could rise to $1.76 trillion over 10 years, which can only increase as people switch to government-subsidized health care as the cheaper alternative. That and the government's track record for calculating costs for these things is usually pretty off. So the government made things worse. They didn't even address the things that do drive up prices, like how you can't move insurance across state lines, thus reducing competition, tort reform that stops frivolous lawsuits in defensive medicine, or doctor licensing. Did you know that at one point, healthcare was so cheap that doctors actually lobbied the government complaining that it was too affordable? Not even joking. People particularly poor tradesmen, could afford health insurance for a year for a single day's pay by being part of a fraternal society. These societies were tremendously competitive, and physicians fought like hell to be on retainer. And these fraternal societies covered everything, from common checkups to catastrophic care. Imagine paying $10 a year, and that covered every medical need you could ever want, plus life insurance. The only reason you don't have it right now is because the government said so. I mean, yeah, the American Medical Association wanted it, but without the state, the only reply that the association would have heard is, Who cares? What innovations have we missed out on? What diseases could have been cured had the government not solved the last healthcare crisis? If the state isn't abolished, in another 80 years, we'll be asked to surrender more of our freedom to the government to solve the next healthcare crisis. Can we also address the brutal rape and murder of ethical standards? Obama requires you, by law, to purchase something whether you want it or not, or face fines. Freedom of association means not only can you associate with anyone you wish, but that you can choose to not associate. If a coercive monopoly and its statist priesthood can compel you to associate with anyone they wish you to, well, if you think you live in a free country, then I'm sorry, I can't help you. But hold on a second. Obamacare was meant to stop predatory health insurance companies, and they fix it by forcing you to buy from predatory health insurance companies. You know, how you solve a rat problem by filling your house with cheese. Lately, everyone has been talking about immigration, immigration, immigration. We've got to fix immigration. The president wants to rip families apart. We've got to secure our borders. Or whatever else each person of each political persuasion is talking about. But why exactly is there an issue regarding immigration? Well, currently there are several different groups of people, both within the state and in the private sector, who stand to benefit or suffer depending on what immigration policy the state adopts, but only because of the state's existence in the first place. For example, those on the political left know that the easiest way to get elected is by promising to steal more from the rich and redistribute it to the poor. But if they're going to get elected in this way, there has to be a large enough base of uneducated, low-income citizens who want to vote for such a measure. Since, the, since that demographic is not large enough amongst the native population, leftists stand to benefit by flooding the population with large numbers of poor, unskilled immigrants who will vote for bigger government and more wealth redistribution. There are also business owners who stand to benefit from illegal immigration. Many businesses suffer from the arbitrary costs imposed by minimum wage laws. Under the guise of helping the poor, the state swoops in and demands that businesses pay their employees a minimum wage, even if supply and demand puts the equilibrium wage below what the state has mandated. Business owners who cannot afford to pay that much have no choice but to lay off employees, raise prices, or sometimes even close their businesses down. However, illegal immigrants are looking for work as well, and are willing to work for below minimum wage. Of course, 
Business owners know that if they employ these immigrants, the immigrants won't be able to complain about their wages without alerting to the authorities that they are illegal immigrants. This creates an unfair labor market, since citizens are required by the state to receive a minimum wage, but illegal immigrants cannot draw attention to the fact that they are receiving less. However, what would happen if there was no state and no business regulations regarding minimum wage, ethnic minority hiring requirements, or anything else? Well, in that case, if someone in Mexico City wants to move to Colorado Springs because a business owner there wants to hire him, who is harmed? The business owner will only hire him if he believes that the Mexican is truly the most qualified person for the job, and the Mexican will only move if he believes he's truly better off in Colorado Springs based on what he can contribute to the local economy. Since there is no longer a state to forcibly redistribute wealth, there is no worry about immigrants voting for a larger welfare state either. Border security would be unnecessary in an anarcho-capitalist society, since the only form of immigration would be voluntary, economic immigration, in which both the natives and the immigrants who relocate are rendered better off by the move. Here's one of my personal favorites. Everyone remember the financial crash of 2008? The collapse of the housing bubble caused banks and financial institutions over-leveraged on real estate to lose tons of money when the value of houses cratered to historic lows. Firms like Washington Mutual and Lehman Brothers just went completely under. Now what had happened was that banks lent mortgages to people who couldn't afford them, and when they began to default, it caused housing prices to crater. The government implemented TARP, which bailed out businesses too big to fail with $700 billion in stolen tax money. To prevent another crisis from happening again, the statist priesthood passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act in 2010, or Dodd-Frank for short. Take a wild guess who was the real culprit behind the housing bubble in 2008 crash. Oh come on, of course you already know. The Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 was passed to prevent banks from discriminating against minorities when offering mortgages for housing, a practice known as redlining. Goes without saying, redlining wasn't happening. The status priesthood passed legislation on a lie. Wouldn't be the first time or the last time. But how it worked is that lenders who didn't sell enough mortgages to minorities, who would disproportionately be poor, would be forbidden from merging with other banks. That might not sound bad, but in the banking industry, that's a death sentence. Andrew Cuomo's Justice Department during the 90s under the Clinton administration strengthened the Community Reinvestment Act, increasing penalties and stricter lending quotas. In addition, Alan Greenspan's Federal Reserve loosened monetary policy, manipulating the currency to make it easier to get. Monetary policy is pretty complicated, so all you need to know is that it made people want to spend money rather than save it. Now what did they spend it on, you might ask? Housing. This artificially inflated the value of houses which, when poor people began to default on their mortgages, resulted in banks with too many of these crappy loans lose a lot of money. So great work, government. You caused the problem by using government-backed violence to coerce banks into taking loans that no bank with any sense would voluntarily over-leverage on. And when the inevitable happened that anyone with a lick of common sense could have seen coming, you solved the problem by not only not addressing what caused the housing crash in the first place, but doubling down and adding yet more regulations. According to the priesthood of statism, we're just one law away from everything being perfect. We promise. <sighs> Here's the thing. Even if you don't recognize our ethics, government doesn't work practically. They try to solve problems that they themselves create, but blame the inevitable result on the free market that never existed to begin with. It's the hatchling who steals from the cookie jar who then blames it on his brother. The hatchling being the government, the cookie jar, your wallet. There are countless more examples we could give. But the bottom line is, every year the state spends more and more stolen tax money in efforts to fix problems that it itself caused. This is why I've said numerous times that no real change can start until people wake up and realize that the state is an inherently unjust and detrimental institution. It's not something inherently good that just needs to be fixed. It's a cancer that needs to be removed altogether. Anyways, thank you for helping me out, Heretic. The pleasure of deconstructing the mythology and dogma of statism is all mine. 
check out my and my two senses channels. Link in the description. And that's our two cents. So take it for what it's worth. Thanks for watching, everyone. As a reminder, this video was created on the basis of a patron request. All patrons who donate $10 a month or more are guaranteed to have their video requests made once they've been a patron for two months or more. Thanks everyone for watching. If you liked this video, please hit like and subscribe. You can also hit the bell to ensure you're notified every time I upload a new video. This video was made possible by my patrons. If anyone else would like to donate and help ensure that I have the time and resources to keep putting out content, for just $1 a month on Patreon or Maker Support, you'll have your name listed in the end credits of every video and the link to one of your social media platforms listed in the description. You can also support the channel by purchasing My Two Cents merchandise on Teespring. You can also follow me on Twitter, Minds.com, BitChute, WordPress, Gab, and iTunes. Uploads are every Thursday and Saturday, so stay tuned for more videos.